Hump Day. Today is Wednesday, November 30th. Welcome to episode number 251 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier, and over the next 45 minutes, I'll be delivering the top cybersecurity news stories of the day and providing my expert analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. So, how can you operationalize it today at work? Or if you're looking to break into the industry, we got you covered. A, you're going to be asked, how do you stay current in the industry? This is a perfect answer. And B, all the different things we're going to cover are going to touch on all the different topics in industry. You'll get context. You'll get exposure. You'll learn terminology, threat actors, behaviors, the works. Plus, the networking is absolutely dynamite in here. Kenneth Ruff knows what I'm talking about. Jack Scott in the house. Chris Weaver. What's up, Paula Terranova? We're going to have a good time. But before we get into it and before Worldwide Wednesday... I'm a little high up. I'm a little short here. What am I? There we go. There we go. Now I'm in frame. Uh, before we get into it, I want to say what up. Thanks to the stream sponsors, starting with my good friend Eric Taylor over at Barricade Cyber Solutions. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. You can see on the stream if you're watching with me. I got the site up right here. Pretty straightforward. You scroll down a half a click. There's Eric Taylor's personal calendar. You can find a time, hop right on it, have a call, get your business squared away in no time flat. I also want to thank the stream sponsor, Recon Infosec. Eric Capuano and the gang over there. Recon Infosec. Listen, if your organization's large enough to have real cybersecurity concerns, but maybe not quite large enough to build a full-fledged security operations capability from the ground up, check out the Managed Detection and Response, MDR, offering from Recon InfoSec. Their offering includes the people, process, and technology needed to deliver full-spectrum security operations for organizations of any size. Guys, if you have... <laughs> If you're just overwhelmed by alerts or you don't have time to look at them or you're a one-man band or you're a matrix network engineer working out of Houston area and you're responsible for looking at firewall logs and, and email alerts and phishing, stuff like that, guys, for a fraction of the price of hiring someone, you can have a managed detection and response capability like Recon InfoSec and give you massive value. Rando with the hype machine, my man. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Love it. Thank you so much for the chat support. I want to remind you, if you hold professional certs like the CISP, SISM, CISA, uh, each episode of the Simply Cyber Di Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPE, so it stacks two and a half a week, 10 a month. Be sure to say what's up in chat. Specifically today, I'm going to ask you to tell me where you're at in a hot second. This is literally the easiest way to document and earn CPEs. If you're live, love it. Can't wait to find out where you're from. Thanks for being here. If you're on Team Replay, love seeing the comments and the chats after the streams about where you are and that you're on Team Replay. Hashtag re Team Replay. Little love. Thanks for catching the stream. Now, it's Worldwide Wednesday, y'all. Let's do it. Where are we at? Where are we at? I don't have a cool little graphic. Give me one second. World. Let's do it really quick. Worldwide. Images. Do, 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 do. It's about to get real. Here we go. This one's fine right here, right? Doink. Oh. 
All right, guys. Where we at? Where we at? Where we at? Do it, do it, do it. All right, we got New Jersey in the house, Phoenix in the house, Arkansas, Wisconsin. We're rocking the United States. What's up, Texas in the house? Hey, Canada. New Brunswick, Canada. All right, I'm marking North America off. Solid. Uh, Manitoba, Canada. Kicking the Red Canary shirt. You damn right. Internal Stranger whipping Australia's online. What's up, Michigan? Arturo, I thought I saw South America come in earlier. Ohio, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Flow Rider up in here, Robert Moritz. Hey, what's up, Lego Sec? Coming from the great state of New York. Chesapeake's in the house. Charlotte's in the house. More, more Georgia. I love it. Where are we at? South America. South America. I saw it too, Carrie, when I came on. Prague, Czech Republic. Thank you, Europe, for being online. Where are we at? California in the house. H-Town, baby. Love it, New York. Where we got? Where's India? Where's A- Asia? Where's our Central America? Ventura, California. Yeah, come on. Doris from Germany. Where we at? Indiana's in the house. Happy birthday, Jim Wales. New Orleans. New Orleans. Saw Iraq. I'm going to take it for the Middle East hit. Doink. Whoop, whoop. Where we at? Where we at? We've got, looks like 50 seconds, y'all. UK's in the house. Great Britain, Peetsville. Thank you for bringing Europe on. We got Africa. Greensboro, North Carolina. West Palm Beach. I love it. Guys, we need Asia, the biggest continent. Africa. And Central America, if we can pull it off. Where we at? Where we at? If you said it and I missed it, say it again, please. Come on, Worldwide Wednesday. Come on, Worldwide Wednesday. 25 seconds. 25 seconds. Oh, no. Did chat break? Russia. Russia, come on. India. Japan. China. Brazil here. All right, we got some Brazil. South America, definitely on. Oh, my God. All right. Well, that that was not, uh, that was not a strong showing, y'all. All right, let me pause. All right, so what's up? Botswana. All right. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take Botswana. Thank you. Africa in the house. All right, guys. So Asia, we missed Asia. Good work, everybody. We totally nailed it. St. Kitts is in here. I'll take, I'll take that for Central America. Guys, um, we did great. We did wonderful. We missed Asia. Hey, Poland. What's up? Good to see you. So, um, Russia is both Europe and Asia. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to take credit for two. That is true, internal stranger. That is true. All right, guys. Good work. Um, I did tell my family over Thanksgiving break about Worldwide Wednesday, and I, I think they're in here. Um, Pakistan. Yato's in here. You know what? I'm going to take Pakistan. Um, I would argue it's Asia, not Middle East, if we want to really push it. Yeah. All right. We'll do it. We'll do it. All right. So we'll, we'll call this a poor man's uh, Worldwide Wednesday complete complete poll because uh, we're pushing Pakistan as Asia. I did not see someone from Russia chime in, so I don't know. Yaido says it's Pakistan. All right, y'all. We did it. Nice job, everyone. Niagara Falls in the house. All right. So nice job, everyone. We totally owned it. Sit back, relax, and let's do the news. Congratulations, everybody. We absolutely nailed it. I got to turn a fan on, too. Woo. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. It's Wednesday, November 30th, 2022. Hackers use trending TikTok invisible challenge to spread malware. Threat actors are capitalizing on a popular TikTok challenge to trick users into downloading information-stealing malware, according to new research from Checkmarks. The scheme is based on a trend called invisible challenge, which involves applying a filter known as invisible body that just leaves behind a silhouette of the person's body. This has led to a demand for an unfilter that would allow the viewer to see the person within the silhouette. Attackers are now posting TikTok videos with links to rogue software dubbed Unfilter that purports to remove that applied silhouette. This software, however, deploys Wasp Stealer malware (laughs) hiding inside malicious Python packages Uh. and is designed to steal users' passwords, Discord accounts, cryptocurrency wallets, and other sensitive information. You are so dumb. You are really dumb, for real. Uh, okay, guys. Like, there's so much to unpack here. First of all, like, why, why, why is this? Why is this a trending challenge? So literally, you get naked and then hope that the filter covers your body up, and then you put it on social media. 
what are we doing here? Is are we devolving? What are we doing here? Here's an idea. Like, I like I educate my kids. Like, listen, like, or you know, I mean, my kids are a little young, but like I've told this people, like, don't take pic. Like, if you take a picture of yourself and text it to someone, right? It's it's out there, right? It, it, don't do that. That's a bad idea. This is absurd this is absurd like i'm not even talking about the wasp malware info stealer i'm literally talking about the tiktok challenge i mean am i officially in, am i crazy y'all am i am i like get off my lawn am i that old now where i'm yelling at kids to get off my lawn because because to me this invisible challenge is get off my get off the invisible challenge what are we doing here okay so let's put that aside let's just let's just put it aside there's a filter that you can apply that makes you uh, blur out. So you know how we blur the background normally? They blur the foreground so you can be, you know, you know, whack, whack. You could be doing whatever you want and it's going to be blurred out. Now, again, why you wouldn't do this? But obviously people are doing it, obviously. So now this is, this is a nice, this is a very nice amalgamation of different types of techniques all packed into one so first of all um first of all hitting a trending topic right i say this all the time fifa world cup's going on look for a spike in fishing black friday spike in fishing holiday season uh package delivery spike in fishing right like threat actors are going to capitalize on whatever's hot right this invisible challenge beyond my comprehension is hot right now so threat actors targeting that second of all obviously especially i would argue young adolescent men are very interested in taking that filter off either a to um check out what's going on behind the blur or to um you know uh, uh, uh compromise someone right Tr to trick them so when there's this push of an invisible uh filter remover Obviously, it's going to take off. And I did some research on the story because BSEC shared this with me in, in Discord last yesterday or two days ago. Um, the, the threat actors actually made a video and posted it to TikTok that went viral showing that the invisible filter can be removed using this tool. Now, of course, the, fo the, the video was completely doctored. Their, their code does not do anything, right? But they did it. Now... So that that lends social proof that like, oh, it can be done. Click here, here, here. It is a GitHub repo. Uh, it has been taken down already. But um, what they did was that was really, really interesting is, and I'm not a huge GitHub repo person, but GitHub is an open source platform for storing software, right? I have some GitHub stuff, but it's not code. It's like cybersecurity resources. Anyways, Anyone can put code up in there. Anyone can download code from up there. There's a way to kind of like pair your code with other repos. So these these guys right here, these threat actors tied their malicious payload to like a really popular GitHub repo that had like 46,000 stars or whatever. Again, to lend social proof that yes, this thing is legit. It's been vetted. Thousands, tens of thousands of people are using it. It's legit. Go use it. Okay, so that's two parts of the attack. The third part that I found really interesting is they took an actual existing piece of working code. Again, I don't think it removes the filter. It does something. Whatever it does, it runs, right? And they simply added an import statement to the Python that, ha that had um, like code in the import statement. So they're not importing a library from somewhere else. They're importing straight code and the code's all obfuscated. This story is worth drilling into and looking at because it's really got a nice clean i mean again hat tip to the threat actors but it's got a nice clean easy to follow attack methodology on what the threat actors were doing and how they achieved it and at the end of the day they're getting all these people to install an information stealer with their permissions on their systems and off and running now again um, you'd have to install this on a, a computer, a workstation, not like an iPhone or something like that, because you, you don't have a Python interpreter on your iPhone. But that aside, they definitely hit a lot of people. I don't know if they mentioned how much money they made. Um, it's kind of hard to say because they're stealing credentials and crypto wallets. That you can't you can't really track how many crypto wallets lost money because of this malware. But anyways, woo! Fancy! Cyber Monday online sales hit record.
Although expectations for this year's holiday online spend were lukewarm, Cyber Monday pulled in $11.3 billion in sales online, according to figures from Adobe Analytics, which tracks seasonal e-commerce activity. This is 5.8% more than consumers spent on the same day last year and sets a record both for the day and for the year so far. This is despite the fears of inflation potentially dampening consumers' spirits. Adobe said that these figures were based on more transactions overall and points to retailers' deep discounts paired with greater availability of goods after shortages of the years before. Hey, Kimberly. Great cash, homie. Okay, so, so check it out. Uh, this is surprising to me, okay? So Cyber Monday, at least from a United States perspective, I am in the U.S., had record $11.3 billion. A couple of things. They said deep discounts in the story. For me, A... Aside from the GRC masterclass being 50% off, a lot of the deals I saw were like not Cyber Monday deals. They were like 10% off, 15%. Like they were like, it's Tuesday, It's here's a deal. So I don't know about you guys, but I didn't see like door buster deals. Second of all, um, I mean, I was looking for a couple of things. They weren't on sale at all. Third, what I saw that was really actually on sale was software as a service. So, so like, so product that does that scales incredibly easily because it's just licensing right um i don't know what other people saw but like to me the, can can i get a this is fine dog emotes and chat from squad members please in in my mind we're having record layoffs there's a recession happening right now inflation is out of control mortgage rates are like seven percent and people are like Woo! gotta get that 15 percent deal baby Great cash, homie. good god are you kidding me like if this is i don't with all due respect i don't believe this story it just seems counter to everything i'm smelling seeing hearing experiencing as a consumer in the u.s economy so I don't know if this is like propaganda to be like, get it, just get it, spend that money. You know what I mean? But um, I don't know. I don't know. But just know, I guess if you're a business owner, you should be double fisted right now and love and life because, you know, signs would indicate people are dropping money. Sandworm Gang launches monster ransomware attacks on Ukraine. The Russian criminal crew Sandworm is launching another attack against organizations in Ukraine using a ransomware that analysts at Slovakian software company ESET are calling Ransom Bogs, B-O-G-G-S. In a Twitter thread, the ESET researchers wrote that they had detected Ransom Bogs deployed within the networks of multiple organizations in Ukraine. While some aspects of Ransom Bogs are different from the malware that has been linked to Sandworm, such as the malware's code being written in .NET, the deployment methods are similar to the one seen last April during the Indestroyer 2 attacks against the energy sector. North Carolina. Okay, so, uh, you know, like basically, I'm surprised, honestly, I'm surprised Sandworm hasn't already uh, appeared or presented itself in the Ukrainian war. Um, I'm not an expert. I have not read the Sandworm book, um, but the the limited amount of information I do have, Sandworm is a sophisticated tier one APT out of Russia. The reason I'm surprised we haven't seen them already, frankly, is because why would Russia be holding back a cavalry or reserves to, to, to attack, right? I mean, like, let it go YOLO and throw everything at Ukraine. I'm not saying, I'm not pro- I'm not for this war, by the way. I'm just I'm just sitting in the seat of Russia at this time. If you got if you got a ton of weaponry, like why are you gonna like hold back? Right. So, anyways, that's why I'm surprised Sandworm hasn't come out yet. Um basically they're launching ransomware attacks on Ukraine. Again, you gotta remember too, guys. Uh ransomware, yes, it does. Um, the whole point of it is to lock up data and then extort money from victims. I'm positive Sandworm and Russia isn't trying to extort money from Ukraine. They're using it more as, I, I would almost argue, a very, um, you know, easy to deploy denial of service attack where you're just b basically bricking tons of systems in Ukraine, kind of mucking up the works of Ukraine, throwing throwing all sorts of like jelly into the engine that is Ukraine um, and, and kind of screwing that up. So that that's what I think that they're doing here with the ransomware. I mean, maybe they're going to get paid, but like, dude, Sandworm, why would Sandworm want your money, right? That's not their goal. That's not what they're up to. Um, they're known famously for the Indestroyer um, 
code base that went after uh, IC industrial control systems uh, and took down some of that. Um, Sandworm adds a cartoonish flair to its series attacks with reference to the 2001 Pixar animated movie Monsters, Inc. <laughs> I guess the ransom note says, Dear Human Life Form. I don't know. People in chat, you tell me. You tell me. I'll go back and look. I mean, does it make... Why, why, would, they be, why would they be trying to extort money from Ukraine? They're literally at war with them. Like, they don't... It's not about the money. It's about, it's about negatively impacting and uh, depreciating the capability of the Ukrainian government to defend itself. So, I don't think... You know, I don't know. Whatever. I'm just one dude. And a college confirms ransomware group stole sensitive data. Guilford College in North Carolina has confirmed that ransomware actors who attacked their school also stole sensitive data from students, faculty and staff. A spokesperson for the 185-year-old college said that the attack occurred in October. They continued, quote, while our investigation remains ongoing, we do have evidence to suggest the unauthorized actor responsible for this incident may have illegally accessed sensitive data, end quote. On Friday, the Hive ransomware group took credit for the attack and threatened to leak the data stolen, posting samples of what was taken on October 21st. All right, well, that sucks. I was thinking maybe Vice Society ransomware threat group, since, they, since they're all hot and, hot and heavy on um, attacking education. All right, so Guilford College, another university, another higher ed institution that doesn't really have the money to properly protect itself. In my experience, higher ed typically has IT. They don't typically have InfoSec. Um, so they got hit with ransomware. It, it's another day, another victim, guys. Like ransomware, it, it, if you're going in for a job interview, like right before you go in, just Google ransomware news and there'll be a story that day of some victim getting victimized. Read the story and then when you go in the interview, like weave it into your interview question answer period in some way. And like, you'll be like, oh, I just read, I just read this morning that Guilford College got hit, you know, like, and then you can read into this thing. So um, th here's the thing. They disconnected their systems and hired outside security experts. I want to point out, I say it every day and you guys are probably desensitized to it. But when I say barricade cyber solutions have a plan, this is where that comes in. They hired outside security experts. Do you know what you don't want to do when you're dealing with an active ransomware incident? Vet outside security experts. Do the due diligence. Get the contracts in place. Go through procurement. No, you want that all done already. So you, you know, heaven forbid you have to do this. But, you know, when you get punched in the stomach, uh, you want to be able to respond quickly, not evaluate, like, you know, how your stomach feels or, should you know, should you stand up? Should you punch? So anyways, um, these guys are... Basically, I, I hate to say it, but this is just a garden variety ransomware victim. I mean, I can tell you exactly what they're going to do. They're going to um, try to get the critical systems back online. They're going to issue a statement to all the affected individuals that they take privacy and security seriously. They're going to offer a year or two of identity theft protection. They're probably not going to pay the ransom because it's, it's probably too high, right? Hive is probably going to publish their public information out there. They'll recover and they'll move on. Like that's my, it's like so boring. It's like, it's like such a boring, it's not even a hot take. It's a, just a take. That's what's going to happen because that's basically the SOP nowadays. We've gone through enough of these where you can see the pattern quite clearly. And now a word from our sponsor, Automox. Are you tired of using multiple tools to patch your third-party applications? With Automox, you'll gain complete visibility of all your software and the ability to patch it automatically from a single platform. Fix missing third-party patches with the click of a button to dramatically reduce the time, effort and complexity it takes to maintain a strong security posture. To learn more, visit Automox.com. That's A-U-T-O-M-O-X dot com. All right, mid-roll, you know what we do. Hey, hey, hey! All right, y'all. It's the mid-roll, so I get to break cadence for a second and tell you guys how much I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for being here today. Want to give a shout-out. Haircut Fish, good luck on the interview, my man. 
I want to say I saw Jack Scott's name fly by. She's got the blue SC squad logo. That's OG, people. Uh, that's the actual colors of the Simply Cyber uh, branding, the, the blue. And uh, get it? I think she's been a squad member for either six months or a year. Uh, I made it the, uh, like, the top uh, achievement, uh, which is pretty cool. Guys, want to thank Barricade Cyber Solutions and Recon InfoSec for sponsoring the stream. They enabled me to do all this fun stuff. Like, you see all the graphics and crap like that. The, the increase in production value. Um, love it, love it, love it. Thank you all so much. Guys, I do want to remind you, I'll be saying this all week. Yeah, Jack Scott. I do want to remind you all, guys, that I'm part, well, Simply Cyber, you know, by virtue of that, all of us are part of Cybersecurity Cares. This is a charity uh, that we're working with right now. 91% of every donation goes directly to putting food in a kid's mouth, right? So 91 cents for every dollar goes directly to putting food in. This, this charity has been vetted by an independent party to validate that this is true. And you can see Lima Charlie's kind of taken the lead on this one, but Recon Info Sex involved. Soteria, which is a Charleston based company, great people over there. Simply Cyber, whoop, whoop. And all these other great companies are involved. If you're interested in donating, I personally donated $100 of my own money uh, because I've had to combat hunger and it sucks. Um, I just dropped it in link. If you're interested in doing that, I, I'm trying to figure out a way for Simply Cyber to match. Simply Cyber Community donations. But just, guys, if you got a couple extra pennies, if you've ever dealt with hunger, like really dealt with it, not sure when you're, uh, oh, I'm getting emotional. I'm not even going to talk about this. Just, it's something that we're doing right now. Okay, also, guys, wearing my red shirt. You know what it is. It's Wednesday Offensive. If you guys are interested, later today at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Red Siege uh, Information Security Company. They're an offensive sec company. They host a... 30-minute open Zoom meeting. Uh, it's really, really cool. I've attended multiple times. Jeff McJunkin is coming uh, from Rogue Valley Information Security later today. If you're looking to network, if you're looking to meet other people in the um, industry in a very, really, like, cool way, uh, come check out Wednesday Offensive. I'll drop a link in chat. Uh, love what the people... I, I just really like... Dude, there's certain companies in our industry that are just awesome. Barricade, awesome. Recon Infosec, awesome. Red Siege, awesome, right? Like there's just like Black Hills Information Security, wicked awesome. There's just great people and great companies doing great stuff and I want to promote it and share it with all of you. Again, guys, it's it's pr pretty typical. If you want to get the newsletter I send every Monday, simplycyber.io slash newsletter. I draft this email myself every Saturday and it's in your inbox on Monday morning, 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it's no fluff. It's just, here's three things you can do to reduce cyber risk for your organization. A lot of the time, it's basically just copy and paste. Like, send this email to your executives. Boom. Like, your coffee is still hot. You're like, trying to cool it down. And your boss is already like, oh, my God, this, this guy. Oh, my God, this lady's killing it. She's absolutely the best. Love it. So get on that. Let's do the la, 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 la's and get back to the news, y'all. Thank you, Simple Minds. Let's do the abrupt cut back to the news. Microsoft Defender boosts default tamper protection for all enterprise users. Microsoft has announced that built-in protection is generally available for all devices onboarded to Defender for Endpoint, the company's endpoint security platform. Once applied, this default set of settings provides better protection for enterprise endpoints against advanced and emerging threats, including ransomware attacks. Microsoft stated, quote, initially, built-in protection will include turning tamper protection on for your tenants with other default settings coming soon, end quote. This announcement comes after the company began to toggle on tamper protection for all new customers with Defender for Endpoint Plan 2 or Microsoft 365 E5 licenses starting last year. Twitter user... All right, so I don't understand what tamper protection is here. Respond to... I mean, typically when I think tamper protection, I think of like, you know, physically accessing something you're not like the back of a, 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 um, a 
tractor trailer. You know, they'll put the, the they'll put the like zip tie thing that you can't undo. Like you have to break it to get into it, or the sticker on computer technology, so you have to like cut it in order to be able to access it. Though that's tampering with it. This is all uh, tech, so maybe I don't know. I I don't know. But what I will say, what I will say is that a I like that Microsoft is making protections the default. Like guys, every for every Carl, right? Can we can we help Carl out by just making it secure from by default? Like the, I I don't know why this gets me all hot and bothered. Like it should be secure by default and then you turn off things to make it work. Not wide open and you turn things on until it doesn't work. No one's turning things on until it doesn't work, right? That's been like the bane of our job for decades is, or, you know, at least years is like, like, like pandering to, to or be- begging to turn on certain things. And then the IT people are like, well, <laughs> right. And then you're like, oh my God, you got to make all these like cases and arguments and metrics. And even then they're not sure they want to turn it on. You turn it, you make it by default, and then, like, you have to make it easy, people. Make it easy for them. By default, on board, go get it, Microsoft. Thank you very much. Um, now, they only said tamper proof or tamper protections or whatever, so I don't know exactly what value you're getting, but I do appreciate that they need to make the onboarding process much smooth, like, super smooth, and they need to like secure all the things. And the final thing I'll say, this is slightly beyond Microsoft Defender, but can we, can I, like, can I get, make a flag and like lead the charge on having IOT devices require you to change the default admin password before you're allowed to use it? Like make that a step. It's not that hard to require it. It's like, it's, it's so, in, like default admin creds just piss me off, like to no end. It's like, what are we doing here? Like why? No one needs that, all right? All right, so I have heard, I, I like Microsoft Defender. I, I like how it integrates with the whole platform. I like how it can push telemetry to Sentinel. I'm all, I'm all on board. I have heard from industry experts that Microsoft Defender can get shredded pretty easily by threat actors. I've seen multiple pieces of malware that are able to disable Microsoft Defender. So if you are going to be using Defender, and if you have budget, do a proof of concept on multiple uh, EDR solutions. If you don't have budget and you're an Office 365 shop, Defender is a good option to consider. At least it gives you some protection, right? If you're if an advanced threat actor is going to get you, chances are they're going to get you anyways. Uh, so you know it it is what it is. Okay. Toasty. Stolen data leaked online and more shared privately. Over 5.4 million Twitter user records containing non-public information stolen using an API vulnerability that was fixed in January have been shared for free on a hacker forum. Another massive, potentially more significant data dump of millions of Twitter records has also been disclosed by a security researcher demonstrating how widely abused this bug was by threat actors. The data consists of scraped public information as well as private phone numbers and email addresses that are not meant to be public. This data was collected in December 2021 using a Twitter API vulnerability disclosed in the HackerOne bug bounty program that allowed people to submit phone numbers and email addresses into the API to retrieve the associated Twitter ID. This whole thing is an expansion of an ongoing exploit by the hacker known as Pom Pom Purin, who initially offered Twitter user records for sale in July and is now stating that this second data dump was not sold and was only shared privately amongst a few people. All right, a couple things here. One, Dennis, I'll answer what your question, what's proof of concept in a second. D- don't let me get away without explaining it, okay? All right, so we just talked the other day, um, unless this is the same story, but I think this is a different story about how, um, oh, that was WhatsApp. Yeah, WhatsApp got scraped for 500 million. Um, now 5.4 million Twitter users data leaked online. Um, now, what data was it? Okay, it says non-public information stolen. So I think it's just email addresses, which is not something you want. Uh, Basically, this is kind of cool. So Twitter ID, name, login, name, location, verified status. Okay, here's the thing. Twitter had an API. The API got uh, exposed. Well, so the API is exposed. API is an application programming interface. It is designed to allow software to 
query the data set behind it, okay? So think of an API, like you and I go to google.com and there's a text field and we type in our search engine, Gerald Osher, Simply Cyber, hit enter, get results, okay? Well, that's a human interfacing with the application. Applications can be written to interface with the application also, right? This is how people write scripts, bots, all these things, right? And the way that they interface with it is through APIs. The developers of the application create the APIs and make them available. This API re uh, revealed too much information. So that was the problem here. It was discovered through a bug bounty program and posted there, which means, it, you know, the word got out essentially. Now, Twitter should have closed it up because it was disclosed responsibly through the hacker one, but it got out before that was the case. This hacker used that API call just the way it was designed to scrape all that data. They wrote a simple script or, you know, a, um, they use burp suite or something like that, or a simple script to just query the API and iterate over either user IDs or, you know, index numbers like user one, user two, user three, and just got all that data. And now they posted it online. This is a pretty straightforward data scraping, sensitive data breach kind of thing, uh, period, end of story. I don't know how much money they'll get for 5.4 million users, um, you know, names, login names, and locations, simply because, you know, I don't know what the value is of that. Also, Twitter's on fire. Where's my man Elon in chat? There we go. Drop some Elon in here. Um, anyways, guys, this is basically a, this is a perfect little case study. If you're, if you're not familiar with, web scraping or APIs or whatever, uh, this is a nice little buttoned up perfect story on how, you know, I guess overreaching APIs or not properly secured APIs can leak information um, and how threat actors use it. Also, look at the WhatsApp story from just a couple days ago for the same exact problem, except I think it was tenfold, right? It was like, or a uh, hundredfold more, right? I think it was like 500 million records or something like that, something crazy. Okay, now really quick, uh, Dennis asked, what's a proof of concept? R real quick, this is just a little education thing. In, in the world of, you know, really IT, but in my cybersecurity world, say you're going to buy a product like uh, Endpoint Detection and Response, like Microsoft Defender, like we just talked about, okay? Well, Microsoft Defender isn't free. It costs money. So you have to request budget. Well, if you're going to ask for budget, what are you spending your money on? Well, we need endpoint detection and response. Well, it behooves me as a prudent buyer of some technology, especially because you're going to be getting like on board with them and locked in to evaluate like the big players in the market. And this is why we talk about like the Gartner uh, magic quadrant or the force wave or whatever, where they identify the best products in the business. Um, usually the top right quadrant. So let's just say for the sake of discussion, you identify Microsoft Defender, Carbon Black and Sentinel One as the three EDR solutions you want. Now, Sentinel One's wicked expensive, and Carbon Black has like really good pricing, but it you know it could expand as as logs crease or whatever. And then Microsoft Defender is the cheapest one. Okay, the proof of concept is you put all three agents into your environment. Like maybe you have ten computers with Microsoft, ten computers with Sentinel One, ten computers with um, carbon black. Then you take a tool. This is just coincidence. You take a tool like atomic red team, right? And you blast it at the EDR solution, all three of them. And you see how it performs. You see if the EDR solution has, um, performance problems, right? Like the laptop doesn't work. It's wicked secure, but no one can use it. So that sucks. Um, you see if it, how much does it catch? Does it catch ransomware? Does it catch info stealers? Whatever, whatever, whatever you evaluate it. Right. And then you score it and you say, okay, you know what? Sentinel one's the best one, but it's too expensive for what I need to spend money on. Carbon black was pretty good and it's right in the middle. Microsoft Defender got hosed and it's the cheapest one. Like, let's go with carbon black. So a proof of concept is merely the activity of experience of experimenting and validating um the options in the market for a technology solution that you need to implement. And, and basically doing the due diligence instead of being like, like, instead of being like, oh, I, we need EDR. Like, get me uh like, how much can I, how much is Microsoft Defender? 80 grand? Sure. Hey, I need 80 grand. No problem. Like, like that is a reckless way of choosing your technology solutions. I mean, sometimes you don't have a choice. Sometimes you're in a hurry, you know, but 
But it, yeah, I mean, dude, I have seen people, this is no joke. And I know many of you have done this. I have seen people like I've gone into environments on a consulting gigs and you go in and they have multiple solutions doing the same thing, right? They have multiple EDRs, which makes no damn sense. Like why, why are you spending money on both of these things? Oh, because we acquired this business and they were running that and they were running this. So we just kept both. It's like, like, okay, you're just like burning money. Is that what we're up to here? Or, you know, you've got multiple like authentication options and stuff like that. Like, uh, like Okta and Duo in your environment. And you're like, what the hell are you guys doing here? Like, what are you doing? Um, anyways, that, that gets into like budget and renewals and how long's the contract for, and can you, you know, pit vendors against each other that it's, that's, that's CISO life. When people talk about, I want to be a CISO. Trust me, it's not all zero days and leet speak. It's it's a lot of budgets and, and uh, product evaluations and dealing with vendor emails. Oh my God. You should see my email after I got back from Black Hat. Ugh. A wave of cyber-enabled scams target FIFA World Cup fans. Oh, here's a surprise. As the global soccer tournament enters its second full week in Qatar, FIFA World Cup scams are proliferating as cyber criminals aim to score big from unsuspecting fans, according to data collected by cybersecurity firm Group IB. Researchers said Tuesday they have identified as many as 90 potentially compromised Haya accounts, which is the mandatory system established so World Cup attendees can enter Qatar and access tickets and other services such as transportation. They have also observed the attackers using info-stealing malware such as Redline and Erbium, fake merchandise and ticket websites used to steal money directly or swipe banking credentials, 40 fake apps in the Google Play Store promising access to tickets, and at least five websites purporting to be job application forms used to harvest personal information. Irish regular... All right, so... Uh, okay, like, guys, from from the... Office of obviously. I wish I had um I wish I had the the sound effect. I got to get the one where the guy's like obviously. Like I like everybody could have told you this. This was going to happen with the increase of fishing. Yes. But got to remember guys, a lot of people are traveling to Qatar for World Cup. This country has its own laws, its own, you know, cultural um requirements. Alcohol isn't is like a thing that's not okay over there like the way that men and women interact is not is is different. So a lot of people are trying to be, you know, good global citizens and follow the rules. So you can understand why when you get an email from Haya, which is they said in the th in the story here, Haya accounts that that's the that's like basically it sounds like that's kind of like immigration services or the, you know the national tourism board or whatever like people are expecting to interface with Haya in order to it see it's a mandatory system for World Cup attendees to enter Qatar so you're required mandatory to to interact with this thing right so you're being told by your embassy or by your travel agent or whomever hey you're going to have to interface with this so you're already primed expecting to put in information. When you are traveling and spending money, lots of money to go to this friggin' um, event, when you get a thing that says, hey, we need your social security number, date of birth, you know, first burn child's name, all this crap, and you don't submit like your social and you go to hit submit and it, it goes, uh uh, and you need to re fill out all required fields, right? Well, you're on a phishing site. You don't realize it because the higher thing is already compromised. You're going to put all that information in because you need to advance so you can continue on with your trip. So I'm not surprised. It sucks, honestly. It's very unfortunate that they were compromised and the Qatar you know, government or whatever isn't doing a, a good enough job to protect the visitors to the World Cup. A lot of people are going to lose some, a lot of money and stuff like this. Um, they said that they're also installing malware. So I could imagine it didn't get into it in the details, but I could easily manage, imagine some instance where they're like, oh, like as part of COVID protocol or as part of tracking protocol or as part of our religious requirements, you need to install this app on your workstation so we can validate that you aren't looking at porn or something, which is illegal in Qatar. And in reality, it's Redline Info Stealer. And they're just harvesting all your creds, all your bank accounts, all your session tokens, and it just sucks. Like, I'm trying not to say suck as much because I yelled at my kid for saying suck the other day. Um, 
I said, oh, you should, instead of saying sucks, why don't you use like descriptive adjectives to explain why it sucks? And, and I'm up here saying suck, 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 suck. So anyways, um, way to go United States beating Iran and moving on to the uh, tournament of 16. So whoop, whoop. I'm a big fan of that. But, uh, you know, too bad for people who got scammed. I would say if you do know anyone who is gone to Qatar, who is part of World Cup, uh, as 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 a as a player, as a participant, as a fan, tell them about this and make sure that they aren't getting scammed, right? Like they may have already been compromised, so make sure that they check their bank accounts and all that stuff, change their passwords. It's gonna it's gonna be bad. Later finds Facebook for leak of users' data. Ireland's Data Protection Commission has levied fines of $277 million against Meta platforms for failing to safeguard the personal data of more than half a billion users of its Facebook service, ramping up privacy enforcement against U.S. tech firms. The fines follow an inquiry initiated by the European regulator on April 14, 2021, close on the heels of a leak of a collated data set of Facebook personal data that had been made available on the Internet. Meta acknowledged that the information was old data that was obtained by malicious actors taking advantage of a technique called phone number enumeration to scrape users' public profiles. This entailed misusing a tool called Contact Importer to upload a huge list of phone numbers to uncover matches. Remember, if you okay. want to get cyber... All right, dude. Okay, so check it out. Um, G Meta Facebook has a... Uh... A, a data leak gets fined. GDPR infraction. This is old news. I mean, meaning the, the, the actual event happened a while ago and now the fine is being levied. Guys, I said this yesterday. I think Ireland's most, um, you know, Ireland's GDP is based on meta fines. Like, I really feel like the, the, the country of Ireland runs their economy off of Facebook fines. Like, they, they've definitely, like, in the last year, they've probably fined them like... Uh, I don't know, over a billion dollars. Didn't we just talked yesterday about Meta uh, having to pay $900 million in fines to Ireland for um, privacy infractions. Uh, yeah, $277 million isn't a lot of money for Meta, but geez, man, it really does add up. Um, look, I'm going to CISO series. I'm looking at yesterday's story. I'm pretty sure it was yesterday, right? Project Zero, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. Do, 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 do. Here, yeah, look at this. <laughs> Facebook. Here's 276 million. So I don't know if this is a different story or the same story, and they just covered it twice in the same day. But um, yeah, 900 million dollars in the past 15 months for Meta from Ireland. So you know, whatever, man. Ireland's gonna get some new public infrastructure. Uh, compliments of Meta. So uh, you know, good on them. And you know, whatever. Meta, Meta's fine. You know, hopefully they clean up their API calls. This Twitter, this Twitter breach that we just talked about, if there's any European citizen data in there, um, they could get a hit too. GDPR is no joke, man. GDPR has real teeth and they people really get into it. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if at some point, it's a cost benefit analysis. Like is Meta still making enough money in Ireland where it outweighs the cost of doing all these fines? Because I mean, a lot of people just pulled out of Russia. It's not un it's not unfathomable for Facebook to pull out of Ireland. Although I, I believe that the amount of money that Facebook makes or Meta makes from selling data is extremely higher than two hundred and seventy seven million dollars. So it's literally the cost of doing business. So anyways, so that's that. All right. That does it for the news. So let's get some uh let's get some action here. I want to thank all of you for being here. I'm going to spend a few minutes kind of chatting it up. We are a couple minutes over. I want to remind everybody that later to, on Friday, we're starting a new show. This is a pilot episode. Simply Cyber Office Hours After Dark. The title will change. It's a working title until we get a little bit more refined. This is Friday, December 2nd at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. It's going to be like a sports talk radio call-in show except it'll be cyber instead of sports people will be wearing security shirts people will be drinking beers if they want to it'll be relaxed we'll ask um very kind of opinionated based questions like what's what's the most frustrating thing of working in cybersecurity, or what's an unbelievable 
you know, ho- like scary horror story of your work experience or whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll have hosts. b will be there. Jack Scott will be there. But the important part is all of you will have the opportunity to call in and, uh, ch- you know, chime in on whatever the topic is at that time. Right. So if you want to if you want to drop a hot take, go for it. It's going to be fun. Uh, again, I'm working working through it. 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, it's a new show, guys. Uh, we'll figure it out together, okay? Want to let everybody know, if you did not know, starting in December, so starting December 5th, I will be streaming Let's Play World of Haiku, Haiku Pro, every single Monday at 4 p.m. Another show. Guys, I'm all about, I'm all about that stream life, you hear? Uh, I'll be streaming World of Haiku, Haiku Pro every Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Jenny Housley, hopefully she's here. Jenny's always helping me out. If you guys want to come, uh, have a good time, party, learn Linux, learn uh, pen testing, do ranges, listen to great music and have fun, join me at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Mondays. I'll be scheduling these out and I'll tell you about them every Monday. Uh, Again, if you guys want to come hang out, this is... This Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I haven't figured out the cadence of this show, whether it'll be once a month, um, when it'll be, everything like that. This show is a pilot episode. Dennis, this is a proof of concept episode. We're going to be testing to see if it works. Oh, naturally me. Yeah, I've got a lot going on. I'm a busy, busy, busy bee. Um, All right, guys, that's going to do it for the stream. If you were here just for the news, thank you so much for being here. I hope you got value. If you did, take take a hot second and hit the like button, right? The little thumbs up button. It tells me and it tells other people that this stream, this show has value and that it's worth their time. Now, if you got no value, hit the hit the thumbs down button if that's there, right? Like, you know, be honest. I'm, I'm objective. I am fair. I think this is a good show. I put a lot into it to, to make it entertaining and educational. But if you think it sucked, if you think it was not good based on the content that I produced, then let me know. But otherwise, hit the, uh, hit the thumbs up. All right. Hey, Carrie. Good to see you, Lego Sack. Chris Weaver. Junior had a question. What was Junior's question? Here, let me scroll back up. Junior, hey, Gerald, what's the best site to get the best average sales pay for a security GRC analyst? Oh, that's a good question. Um, So, you know what? I actually had a, um, give me one second. I actually have a, um, a report from Robert Half Technology that's like a year old that had all industry, I mean, like all verticals, all countries, all roles, salary i have all sorts of assets that i that i um i just i don't know i don't i don't it's not that i don't share it but i just i acquire these things and then i don't think about them all right so check this out junior i'll share this with you this is the robert half technology salary guide from 2021 okay this is a great little report i downloaded this this is in my private google drive but i'll share it to everybody this is, uh, look, I mean, this has got way more than just salary ranges, but we'll get into the salary in a second. Do, 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 do. Where's the salary? Most in, in demand skills, critical roles. Th- there's some real value here. Um, top IT certs. Just dropping bombs here, Junior. All right, so here's the salary table, right? This this explains to you how to... How to um, Uh, This tells you how to um, use this product. I mean, use this report. Junior, what role were you talking about? I think you said GRC junior analyst. Uh, Hold on one second. I'm I'm looking back in chat. Security GRC analyst. Hey, Tiffany, thanks for the sub. All right, so let's look for GRC analyst here. Um, Software apps, consulting and integration, data administration, QA, networking, security. All right, so here's security. They don't really have GRC necessarily. IT auditor. I mean, that's kind of GRC. So according to this, 115 grand is the uh, median, which is pretty good. I got to tell you. Now, Junior, where are you? So here's the really interesting thing. This is the value for an IT auditor uh, salary ranges. But then based on where you are, they actually have uh, scalar va- variables. So Junior, where are you? Like what, what city state are you in? Right, because if you're in California, um, 
you know, Irvine, California, you can add 30% to the salary because that's what's going on, right? Um, okay, good. So Junior's getting paid, uh, it seems accurate-ish. Um, let me know where you are, though, because you have to use these scalar variables, right? If you're in Idaho, Boise, it's negative 11% of like what the median average is. I'll, I'll share this link with everybody if you guys want. Remote Greenville, South Carolina. Oh, I love, hey, way to go, upstate. I'm in the low country, you feel me? All right. Um, hey, Dennis, GRC is not a blue team role. GRC, sec ops, incident responder, digital forensics are considered blue team. GRC doesn't really have a color. I call it gray team, um, but... All right, so South Carolina, just to finish Junior's uh, question here, Columbia is about as close as it gets, minus 6%. Oh, Greenville is minus 4%. All right, so Junior, Greenville is minus 4%. So you take this value right here and multiply it by negative 4%, which is, let's see, 96,000 times, uh, I guess, 0.96, right? 92,000. Okay, so you're pretty you're pretty spot on. Um you're pretty spot on there. On, on the lower end, right? So you could uh you could um you could switch jobs and and get a little bit more junior um and and be able to defend it um and be able to defend it. Orange team is security architecture, security engineering typically, so you're more hands in technology, standing up, rolling out network access control. Um Standing up firewalls, deploying MDM, MFA. That's that's orange team stuff. All right. Yeah, let me know if you guys want... Here, can I make this available to people? Whatever. I'll, I'll make this available to people afterwards. My pleasure. Thanks for asking the question. Thanks, Chris Weaver, for pointing out. I would have missed it, okay? All right. All right, guys, that's going to do it for the stream today. Thanks so much. I hope you all can party with me. Oh, Eric Taylor's up in here. I love Eric Taylor uh, with Barricade Cyber. Yeah, guys, if you um, if you got if you got time, come hang out on Friday at 4:30. Tomorrow is Thursday. It's my last uh, day teaching at the Citadel for the fall semester. So tomorrow's stream is at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, join the discord exclamation discord to, uh, to continue the conversation and keep chatting with us. Um, I, I do want to also mention like whatever for the people who are still here T Tuesday next week is technically my final class at the Citadel, but I do a final review, uh, opportunity for the students. Most students don't take advantage of it. Uh, it will be Zoom. So basically, what what does this mean to you? Next Tuesday's show will probably start at 8, 10 a.m., which is really, really weird. But I'll start my class at 8 a.m. I'll probably have a couple questions. I'll answer the questions, and then that'll be the end of the class. So just FYI. And remember, tomorrow is Thursday. What's your meme Thursday? I've already seen Haircut Fish's meme. You guys are going to love it. It's going to be a good one tomorrow, okay? Shane Himes crushed that final, man. Crush it, crush it, crush it. What, what, what can we do? I came in like a there we go. Hey, naturally me. I am a adjunct faculty in the cyber sciences department. I teach CS 227, which is principles of information security. And for those who are interested, I'm actually developing a course that's you know lightly based on that, that I will deploy into the Simply Cyber School. That's basically... Um, like fundamentals of information security so like the entire industry like and it, it, it'll basically be like a primer course for cybersecurity. so if you if you know nothing about cybersecurity and you're really interested this course will be good for you it'll cover the technology uh cyber terrorism information warfare different techniques by threat actors the industry itself all the roles in the industry uh, malware how to like fish people how to defend from phishing i'm looking at you carl cool. So stay tuned for that. It's just something I'm working on. I just don't have a lot of time, as you all can imagine. I'm a I'm a pretty uh, I'm a pretty busy dude. Um, so that's the thing. All right, guys, that's gonna do it. Thank you all so much for staying the extra 15 minutes. I wish you all the very best. Happy Wednesday. Happy Hump Day. Congratulations on Worldwide Wednesday. Another win. Another win, y'all. Oh, thanks, Naturally Me. Enjoy the GRC course. Guys, be good. We'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Cheers, everybody.